Galatians chapter 3. This is one of, I'm, it's not hard for me to understand this book, but it's hard for me to teach this book because it's very technical. It's very legal without being legalistic because that's what he's addressing. But there are some legal terms here and, there, and there, it's, he goes to great lengths to try to address legalism in the church and religion over relationship with God. Um, again, legalism over grace. They were having a lot of trouble in the church. It started early. It still happens today. But back then it was the Judaizers. It was Jews coming to the Gentile churches and saying, you have to be circumcised. You have to be whatever, anything else. And to be able to actually be a Christian. It's not enough just to have Jesus. You have to have all these other things too. Basically, you had to convert to Judaism to be able to be a Christian because Jesus was Jewish, because the first church was Jewish. For the first few years, it was pretty much all Jewish, uh, with some influence in the Gentile world, but, but not a lot. Uh, and there was a lot of us. Last week, we looked at, at Paul and his conversion and uh, how he had to deal with this, or how he had to deal with it in the past in Antioch, even with Peter. You know, when Peter would come and visit the church, and, and everything was fine until more Jews came from the church in Jerusalem, and then he kind of caved into the pressures there and was uh, adhering to the, the uh, uh, meals and that kind of thing, and only eating what, what Jewish folks would eat and not, not eating even with the Gentiles anymore. And, you know, here he had been doing it all along, but then he gets with these guys. And he's the one, he's the one that had to teach on this. He's the one that took this back to Jerusalem and after visiting Cornelius and the, the Holy Spirit was poured out on his whole house and his whole house is saved. And then he has to go back to Jerusalem and explain to those guys, hey, the Spirit came on, on the, you know. I mean, I'm sure their first question was, why were you, why were you at Cornelius' house? Why were you in a Gentile house? You're already unclean. And then it was, well, you know, I was hanging out with Simon the Tanner over here, and wait a minute, you're in a Tanner's house. You were unclean before you ever even went to the Gentile's house. What are you doing? And Peter's crossing lines all over the place and breaking down those barriers between Jew and Gentile. But then at some point along the way, he starts caving into the pressure to conform back to that. And Paul addresses that to his face and in front of the believers, in front of the other believers, to show, you know, even... Peter's, you know, comes to town like he's a rock star, but he's not. He's a man. He's just a man. Just like Paul, saved by grace, just like Paul, just like the rest of them. And, and he, can, he can fail even at, at things just like the rest of them. I mean, that was, a, that was a lifelong lesson for Peter to have to deal with all the time. You know, even with Jesus. Jesus would tell him before, before he was gone in his teaching that it wasn't what went into a man's mouth that defiled the man, it was what came out of his mouth that defiled him because it came from his heart. And it's our hearts that are wicked and deceiving and it's not our stomach. So Paul is, is dealing with that with the, with the Gentiles or with the, and with the Galatian churches in that whole area there and and he's reminding him that this is, this is, God has knocked down these barriers. This isn't just to the Jews. This is also to the Gentiles without them conforming to the outward appearance of being a Jew. It's like some of these folks that think that you have to, if you're really going to be, you know, taking care of your body the way that God wants you to, you're going to go back to a biblical diet. I'm not going back to a biblical diet. I live in America. I wasn't born in the Middle East. I wasn't... I wasn't born 2,000 years ago. I, I live here. Now, I want to eat healthy. We eat a lot of garbage. And, you know, the, some of the defects we have in our body are our own fault because of what we put in. But that's only symbolic of, of our hearts. That's not the condition of our heart. We don't have to change the way we eat to be saved. All right? A vegetarian is not more saved than a carnivore. Just not. In fact, if you really want to push the issue, I'm going to vote for the carnivore. Amen. You know? But not that I, 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 hey, man, I love my vegetables. As long as I got meat sitting on a plate with them, I'm good. <laughs> anyway, so we get to chapter 3. 
We've had our history lessons. We're going to start dealing with some, some theological things now. And Paul starts right off with, Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to, I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you... <clears throat> Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? So there's the question. And, and he's, foolish Galatians. And it's not necessarily what we would necessarily, you know, if you call somebody a fool, you're kind of implying that they're stupid, right? No. But this is, means in, in, more empty-headed. It's kind of what he's saying. You're empty-headed. But you're willingly empty-headed. Right? This isn't even the condition that the church is in and what they're doing isn't necessarily even completely the fault of the false teachers. It's their fault for giving into it. So we talk a lot about false teachers and about false doctrine and, and what's going on in the church and the junk that's preached in the church right now. But the reality of it is the people in the pews will have to stand before Jesus too. And when they do, they're going to have to answer for their life, not for the false teacher's life. And they have to answer for the decisions that they make and being willingly ignorant of God's word. So if we just go to a church because we like the pastor or because we like the way he speaks or we like the music, you're setting yourself up to fail because you're going to ignore everything else that's there. You're there to feed your own spirit. You're there to feed your own desires, your own lust. You're not there to serve anybody else. You're not there to take in God's word and to grow up and be sound Christians. And if you sit in a church and you listen to the guy because he, 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 he attacks an issue that you like to be attacked or, or whatever, you're on the same issues, you're, what, he dresses good. You guys are losing out on your pastor right now. Dresses good, bad haircut putting on weight every year. I'm not going to be Mr. GQ pastor. I'm just not. All right. I watch y'all. I, I watch the head Bob go. It's like a wave through a baseball stadium. Everybody gets tired, starts over here and just moves through and they wake up and they go to sleep and it, I watch you. I know. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. You know, you'll be awake when God wants you to be awake. I don't have to do anything about it. But listen, they're ignorant on purpose. And that's an issue that's addressed in other places in the Bible too, being willingly ignorant of God's word. And it even starts at the base level to, to be willingly against God. Even, I mean, look at Romans chapter 1. He starts with creation. To be willingly ignorant of, of who created all of this. Anything but God, anything but what the church teaches, anything but what the Bible says. And now it's in the church, and we're going to try to make creation, six literal days of creation. If you read it in the original language, it's six literal days. It's not 6,000 years. It's not 6 million years. It's not 6 billion years. I don't care what popular pastor tries to make it the way that the world wants to make it and tries to make it mesh together. It's not what it is. It's six literal days. Right? And, and there's some really, there are pastors that I had no idea. Pat Robertson, I would have had no idea that he thought it was a, an old earth deal. Oh, really? Yeah. But even after that, after, right after the, the debate between Ken Ham and Bill Nye, he came right out and said, well, science proves that it's, been a, it's an old earth creation. Well, science doesn't prove that. So... It, but it starts right off with that. We're being willingly ignorant. We're anything to make God more palatable to everybody. And it's wrong. He's not palatable to anybody. It is not easy for anybody to take in. Everybody struggles with being selfish and maintaining myself and feeding myself and caring for myself, even at the cost of our closest loved ones. On any given day, we will put ourselves first above everybody else. And that is against God. 
We're to, we're to put God first and everybody else between us and Him in importance. We're to die to ourselves. We're to take this old man and bury him. All our wants, all our lust, all our desires, and put them away. And that is in contradiction to prosperity theologists and what they do and what they say in the church. You can have whatever you want. God wants you to be rich. God wants you to be healthy and wealthy. I got an awful lot of contradiction to that in my life. And you know what? I see in the shortcomings in my life, in my family, in, in the things that I face and the trials that I face, that everybody else would say, or some of those guys would say, if you had enough faith, you wouldn't be going through all that. That's baloney. Well, then, you know, Why did Jesus go to the cross? If I could do it any other way, why did he go to the cross? That's the epitome of weakness. To demonstrate your power and then turn around and let them take you away. He didn't do that so that we could have the power to do whatever and say whatever and speak things into existence. He set the example of selfless sacrifice for everybody else. But we want to be ignorant of that. Because it challenges us to do for others. Right? It's not do to others as they do to you. That's retaliation. That's avenging. That's not what it's supposed to be. It's do unto others as you want them to do to you without any expectation of return. That's hard, isn't it? It's not husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church as long as she follows up on her verses. It's not wives respect your husbands as long as he follows up on his verses. As long as the other one acts first, I'm okay. Or as long as the other one responds in kind, then it's good. It's, I'm all right, I'll keep on going. That's not what we're called to do. We are called to put everybody else first and to sacrifice. And it's hard. It's hard. Listen, if you're a parent, you know that. How many times do your kids wake you up in the middle of the night? Crying. Infants. Can't, can't feed themselves. Can't clean themselves. Can't do anything for themselves. Completely helpless. And you have to respond without any expectation of a return. Listen, if you had kids expecting them to return love to you Im immediately, like they're some kind of puppy... You were completely disappointed, weren't you? There are enough people out there that I run into these days that say, I don't, want, I don't want to have kids. At least they can admit their selfishness. Right? They know, I don't want to get up in the middle of the night and change a diaper or be up with a sick kid. They've made the choice. Some people don't care. They're going to do what they want to do and satisfy that lust, and kids are born, and that's not my problem and not my fault. Yeah, it is. I went to biology class. I passed that class pretty good. <laughs> but we love to be willingly ignorant. We love to say we didn't know or we couldn't have known or whatever. We love it. But it's not true. Paul says, who bewitched you? You empty-headed Galatians, who bewitched you? Who, who made this like sorcery to you? So that you should not obey the truth. You know, most, we think of sorcery, and a lot of uh, in bewitching here is, is kind of uh, applies to that. And when we read the Bible, we see sorcerer, we're thinking pharmakia, and we get the hallucinogens and all the other stuff, and, and, and God says to stay away from them. In fact, in the law, it says to kill them, period. You know, put up with a drug dealer, kill them. That was in Leviticus. Just sorcerer, don't, not just put them out of the camp, done. 
But a lot of it was sleight of hand and trickery. And it still is today. I mean, we had this little game at home, little ball thing. It's like 20 questions, I think it's called. And it, you, you, you're just supposed to think of something, anything. And you start pushing the button, and it asks you a question, and you answer the question, and you answer the next question. And it's just yes or no questions. And in 20 questions, most of the time, it will guess what you're, what you're thinking about. It's probably anything. Now, if they can do a little program and put it in a little chip in a little ball and ask you 20 questions, how hard is it for somebody who's been doing this for a long time to set you down in a dark room and have you put your palm out and just rub your palm and make you feel good and make you relax and have some things floating in the air, the little, you know, sense or whatever to make you relax and, and ask you, just ask you some questions. And pretty soon they know Uncle John's name and because and it, you know, somebody starts with a, starts with a, a J or sounds like a J and, you know, it's ridiculous. It was a, Jonathan Edwards or whatever that used to do that on TV a couple of years ago. And he asked the same questions, to, and pretty soon he's got a whole, he's just leading them right into their life story. And he lets them give the answers before he asks the questions. It's a trick. Even back in Saul's day, it was a trick. When he goes to the witch of Endor and asks her to call up Samuel, and the guy shows up, she freaks out. <laughs> she freaks out, because it's not really supposed to happen that way. But who bewitched you? Who deceived you? Who plays this game? on? Who's doing this sleight of hand? Yeah, they're all about Jesus. They're all about Jesus. But there's this one little thing over here you need to think about. Think about this. Think about circumcision. You look in the, in the, in the law. And God had, had Abraham circumcise himself and circumcise all the men in his home to set him apart from everybody else. Jesus was circumcised. The 12 are all circumcised. Don't you think you probably need to follow that too? See how easy it is to convince somebody you don't have to, or that they need to do something they don't really need to do? The Holy Spirit didn't put it on Cornelius in his house. Don't you think? And that's what Paul's going to be getting at here. Don't you think? that if the Spirit of God wanted you to be circumcised, He would have told you? There would have been something in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, something in the, that you would have known in your heart, I need to be circumcised? I need to change my diet? I need to start making the pilgrimages to, to Jerusalem for the feast days because I'm a Christian? Because Jesus did it. It's very easy to make somebody stumble by just taking things that look right, that sound right, and put it in front of them in a slick way. Right? The Bible teaches about, about giving. The Bible teaches about tithing. In Malachi, God says, hey, test me on this. So you can test him on that. Give me your whole check. You can see what God does for you. Oh, yeah, God does say that. Here. Here's, here's my money. You look at the guy living in a gated community with all the flash and all the stuff. And, and you're going, I'm not, uh, God didn't give me a new house, didn't give me a new car, I gave you my check. Well, you just didn't believe enough. Give me another check. He's got to build up your faith. Amen. Come on. Listen, it takes faith to give, and it takes faith to give when you don't have much or anything else to give. It does. And giving is a biblical principle. But God doesn't want a tenth. How about that? He wants everything. He wants you to understand that he gave you everything to be good stewards of. And to not get tricked so easily into just giving it to whoever. There are a lot of 
inner city missions that could use your money over the guy in the gated community with a TV show. That's not, that is not an evidence that he has a great godly ministry that's being blessed by God. Some men, some ministries take in a lot of money. They take in a lot of money. And they do very well with it. That money goes right back out to missions all over, local and all over the world. And it, and it pays the bills of the place where they're at. And it does. It's great. I mean, Costa Mesa takes in a ton of money. But they had a great example in Pastor Chuck who bought used cars still and, and fixed them himself as long as he could. In a pastor who would go down to the church and, and was caught more than once fixing toilets in the middle of the night. Things like that. In fact, from what I understand, most of the guys on his staff, he paid very little, very little, and expected him to go out and get a second job because if they went out to plant a church, that's how they were going to have to live at least for a while. Because he didn't say, here, here's an account for you and here's a big checkbook and go and plant a church and let me buy you a building and, and whatever. And sometimes he'd buy somebody a building, sometimes he'd buy a camp or whatever for, for guys, sometimes. But if you came to him and say, hey, Pastor Chuck, I think God's leading me to go over here and start a church. Awesome. Let me pray for you. Here you go. And, and when it got tough and they got frustrated and they called the church and, and called back and say, oh, it's so bad. They hoped they didn't get Pastor Romaine because he said, that's fine, brother. You just come back. We'll send somebody who wants to be there. He, he wasn't, Pastor Romaine was not gentle. You didn't want to get a hold of him. But if you got a hold of Chuck, which you could get all the time, he'd probably say, well, let me pray for you. How do you think it's going? Come and, talk, come and see me. Come and talk to me. Let's see what we can do for you. Let's see what we can change for you. Maybe it's something you're doing. Teaching the word? Yeah, it's going to be tough for a while. Just hang in there. All you have to do, I mean, Romaine kept pastors in their own place more often than not by just saying, you know, hey, if, you, if you don't think you're supposed to be there, then come home and we'll send somebody who wants to be there. And like, uh, no, no. Well, well, then suck it up. And that's how he was, old retired Marine. That's how he was. It's easy to be fooled. And Paul's still baffled by this. He said, before whose eyes? You, why should you not obey the truth when, when we portray Jesus for you, crucified, that's it. The cru crucified. He went to the cross for you to give you forgiveness. So you can have his grace. So you can be forgiven of your sin. Perfect, sinless sacrifice. He wasn't on the cross saying, hey, everybody needs to be circumcised. You know, when the centurion came to him and said, you don't need to come to my house. I'm a man of authority. I know you have authority. All you have to do is say so and my servant will be healed. And Jesus said, I haven't found this much faith in all of Israel. But you better get circumcised. That's the one thing that separates him from you guys. He's not circumcised. So, no. In fact, Jesus is ready to go to his house. That would have made Jesus unclean. The woman with the issue of blood, she touches Jesus. He should be unclean. She's making everybody in that crowd unclean. She touches the hem of her garment. Who touched me? Your faith has healed you. Your faith has saved you. The man lowered down from the roof or through the roof to Jesus because the crowd was so tight. Your sins are forgiven. Before, take up your bed and walk. Your sins are forgiven you. 
<gasps> Who can forgive sin? Right? Pharisees are freaking out. Maybe Paul was one of those guys in the corner. What did he just say? Only God can forgive sin. Yeah, so that you know that the Son of Man can forgive sin. And so that you know that it's just as easy for me to say your sins are forgiven as it is for me to say take up your bed and walk just to give you the sign that your wicked heart wants. Get up and walk. Take your bed and get out of here. Go home. And the guy got up, took his bed and walked out. Now the guys on the roof that had the faith to bring that man, you got to hope they're not going to fall through the roof because they've got to be celebrating up there, right? <laughs> hope they're not dancing around and fall back down through the roof on top of everybody. Be the first crowd surfers. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, it would be like, like you see at the concert sometimes, the guys jump off the stage and everybody just whoosh, poof not catching you verse 2 this only i want to learn from you did you receive the spirit by works or by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith how did you receive the spirit how did god start working in your life was it because you were following the law because you were following moses he didn't even know who moses was you didn't know anything about the torah and the law all you knew about was Jesus. Verse 3, are you so foolish? Are you so empty-headed? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect in the flesh? Now listen. This is to us, too. All right, Not just the Galatians. You're all Gentiles. Maybe some of you have a little bit of Jewishness mixed up in there, but for the most part, we're all Gentiles. We've lived like it anyways, right? If you're a born-again believer, you started off in the Spirit. By faith. Somebody said, listen, you need to ask Jesus into your heart. You need to ask Him to forgive you of your sins. If you'll do that, if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, you'll be saved. If you'll do that, you'll be saved. Maybe some of you came to an altar call. Maybe it was a one-on-one -on -one deal. Maybe you heard a pastor talking, you went home, and you just couldn't get it out of your head. You got down on your knees by your bed. However it was, wherever it was, it's the same thing. You started off in the Spirit. Now we know we're being made righteous right now. We're being sanctified. Right? So we're, we're, we're in a process of learning what's, what's right before God, what offends God. Our hearts are revealed to us on a daily basis. Right? You just you drive down the road. The wickedness in your heart will come out of your mouth. People will cut you off. People will, you know, whatever. Throw rocks at your car. Anything. There's, there's all kinds of stuff. Go, go stand. Do a job where you have to deal with people face to face all day long. I guarantee you. Every day, my heart gets revealed to me. I have a Bible open on my counter in the guard shack, and, and somebody just like that just the wrong thing two seconds i'm dealing with this person and just like that the wicked glenn comes out now to keep my job it can't come out at him so i turn around and it's coming out as i'm heading back in knowing that in about five more minutes i gotta face this guy again And I got to fake the smile and you have a great day, which really what I mean is I hope you blow a tire right out there as you're pulling out of the driveway and spill your whole load in the road and block traffic and get a ticket and I hope your day stinks. Because you just spent two seconds with me. Sometimes that's what have a good day means. Now, I could take that and I could decide, well, now, you know what I got to do to get right with God with this? I got to go, because obviously I'm not all the way saved, <laughs> go crawl across the parking lot into the church door, keep my head down while I'm unlocking the door, push my way in, shut the air conditioning off, sit in here and sweat for five hours. 
Maybe it's my haircut, not short enough, not quite right. I should wear a tie on Sunday. Maybe God's doing this to me. Give me these rotten people to deal with because I don't wear a tie on Sunday. You know why he gives them to me? He wants to expose my heart to me so that I will confess, so that I will repent and keep that relationship tight with him. It's not anything I'm doing necessarily wrong outside of my body. It's not the food I'm taking in. It's not anything else. It's, it's me. It's my heart. He says, hey, man, you think you got a hold on this? I'm sending this guy around to you. Watch this. Michael, watch what happens when this guy says good morning to him with a little attitude on it. Or doesn't say anything to him. Why? Never mind. I'm a... <laughs> Never mind. I'm going to have to confess before I'm done. I'm sorry. Gun in the spirit, you mean perfected by the flesh. Is there anything you can do to finish this job off? There's only one thing you can do. Die. Perfection's done. When you go home and you stand in front of the Lord, it's all done. You pass through this refining fire, all the junk burns up. You come out on the other side, pure gold. Right? You stand in front of the judgment seat, the Bema seat. Not the great white throne judgment, thank you, Jesus. The Bema seat. Everything you've done to honor God, you get rewarded for. Everything else you've done to honor yourself falls off, goes away, burned up in the like stubble and wood, refined. There's nothing we can do in this body. There's no, there, there's nothing that we can do to make ourselves perfect, to make ourselves more saved. You know, whoever gets baptized at the beginning of the month is not going to be more saved than they were when they went into the water. I'm not going to be more saved because I'm actually getting to baptize somebody this year. You know, it's not that. He loved you enough to die for you. You might have to go back to the beginning of your faith. Listen, if, if it's everything you can do to perfect yourself, then when you go through an absolutely horrid time in your life, what do you go back to if you have no just basis for your faith? Because if somebody close to you dies, there's not anything that you can do to make that situation better. There's nothing you can do. You mourn, you weep, but we have the basis of our faith. We don't stop believing. We are stripped down to believing our faith. And what do I do from here? You love. I don't want to love. I don't want to love those people anymore. You love them. You love them anyway. You're the, you're the example of Jesus Christ anyways. And you're not going to be able to do it on your own. You've got to have the spirit within you to do it. I can't love all those people coming through that gate on my own. I can't. I fail at it every day. For stupid reasons. But because the Spirit of God is alive in me, between the time that guy leaves, goes back to pick up his stuff, and comes back out to go out, I can be ready for him. And I can be ready to love that guy and be nice to that guy no matter what because I know it's going to dig at him. If he comes back and God is shining in me, Jesus is coming out of my mouth. The Holy Spirit is moving through me. That guy is just going to either be quiet and still go away mad or he's going he's to see it. Verse 4, have you suffered so many things in vain if indeed it was in vain? They were persecuted. Just for believing, they were persecuted. 
They weren't persecuted because they weren't circumcised. They were persecuted because they were followers of Jesus Christ. They were persecuted because they were saved. It's the same thing today. It's the same thing today. We have brothers and sisters all over the world who live in danger of their life being taken from them every day. And the person that takes their life doesn't ask if they're circumcised, doesn't ask if they're eating right. It's more like a statement. It's more like this. You denounce Jesus. And when they won't, they don't say denounce Judaism. They don't say denounce Buddha. Denounce Jesus. Say that you've been wrong all along. And when they won't, their life is done. Paul saying, do you suffer all this stuff, all this loss, all this persecution in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? There's a big question for you. It's really tempting to go there, isn't it? God's not working in my life. I'm in this position because I must be doing something wrong. We haven't learned anything from Job's story. We let our friends, Christian and non-Christian, convince us that we must be doing something wrong or we wouldn't be in this position. Maybe you're not really a believer. Maybe you're not a believer. You know, where is Jesus anyways? Why, if, he was, if God was real, you wouldn't be going through any of this. But we know God does miracles still today. You heard a little bit about ours last week from Tracy. Sarah, without, without giving up your story, because it's too personal, but with what, what, what you went through this last week, would, would any of that happen because, did any of it happen because of anything you did in the, in the first five books of the Bible? It had nothing to do with Moses and the law, did it? Just pouring out your heart. Just believing in Jesus. Just believing in Jesus. And, and I'm, I'm getting texts from her. I'm overwhelmed. God's so awesome. God's so great. The things that happen among you, is that happen because you're doing something, because you're serving in the church, or because you're, you're circumcised, or you're eating right, or you hold your breath longer than anybody else, or whatever it is, is it happening because of that? Is it happening because you're here on Sunday and Wednesday and every other Bible study we have? And Are you coming to church tonight? Tonight's... Service night. Anybody doesn't show up, you're not saved. Only the holy people are going to be here. I know that. <laughs> right? There are guys that put that kind of a weight on their people. Offering wasn't big enough. Let's take another one because y'all are holding back. You know what in those churches? Those guys got bills rolled up in their pocket. They, they know there's at least three offerings coming. I'm going to have a fourth roll just to make sure I got something put in that plate the fourth time. Just stick it all in there the first time and be done with it. If you're really supposed to do it. Take another offering. That's ridiculous. That's playing games with God's people. Paul's saying, listen, he gives you the Spirit. He's working in your heart. He's done miracles among you. Is any of that because of what you've done according to the law, or is it because you believe? So what's the answer? Come on, Dave got some amens this morning. What's the answer? Because of faith or because of what you did? Right. Just as Adam believed God, 
And it was accounted to him for righteousness. Adam, Abraham. See, now you guys got me reading the wrong thing. It's all your fault. You come to church tonight and repent. Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. That, that'll stick a Jewish person right in the, in the heart. Right? They come and they're saying, you got to be like Abraham. You got to be circumcised. You got to go according to the law of Moses. Well, Abraham, if you remember the story, and this is what Paul's trying to get across, Abraham was pronounced righteous 400 plus years before the law because he believed. His faith was accounted to him for righteousness. You go back and read Abraham's story, there's all kinds of silly things he did. Got himself in a lot of trouble. But what made him righteous? Leaving a land full of idolatry, an idolatrous man, a man who worshipped multiple idols, heard from the true and living God, said, you leave your country, you leave your family, you come to me to a place in a land that I've, I'll show you, a place that's going to be an inheritance to you. Leave the rest of it behind. You come and you follow me and me alone. And at that point, Abraham was righteous. Because Abraham left. Because he believed. And he went to a place he'd never seen before. And he left all the junk of his life behind him. That's what made him righteous. Is that not the same faith we have to have? That's what makes us sons of Abraham. That's what makes the, the church today, the believers in the church today, sons and daughters of Abraham. It's not because we're of Jewish descent. When he made the promise to Abraham, take him out, look at the stars. Can you number the stars? That's your descendants. That's how, that's how many. All the earth is going to be blessed because of you, Abraham. Everybody who believes like you will be saved. And it wasn't until later, a lot of years later, that circumcision came. And that was just to mark him and keep him separated from everybody else in the land. An outward physical expression of what had happened in his heart. All the excess, all the baggage cut away by God. The deep secret sins of our lives taken away by God. And the outward expression of that, God chose symbolically to cut away the flesh of the secret parts of his body. But it was an outward expression. Today we have baptism. It's an outward expression. It's our, our identifying publicly with what Jesus had done with him. Identifying with his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. We're publicly identifying with that. They're not things that we have to do. If you die before you're baptized, you're still going to heaven if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. You have to be baptized to go to heaven. There are churches that will tell you they've been baptized by me in this church. Well, you go to their church and try to be members of their church. You've got to be baptized again because they want to make sure, I don't know, make sure you went all the way under or something. I don't know. You know, that's legalism. You've got to get saved in my church or I don't know for sure that you're really a Christian. So you can't take communion. I mean, that played out right in our parking lot. That's legalism. 
That's religion. That's not relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's not people fostering other people in a relationship or discipling other people in a relationship with Jesus. That's pure and simple man-made rules and regulations. Taking what God has ordained and perverting it into something that it was never meant to be. Verse 8 says in the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Sole reason God did it with Abraham before the law. So the Gentiles would understand. I don't have to. I don't have to go through the law. I don't have to sacrifice a bunch of sheep and a bunch of goats and a bunch of cows and and while well, you need to be here on Wednesday to understand really what they had to do every day. We just went through this last Wednesday. And when you start then adding the extra sacrifices for Sabbath and the extra sacrifices for the new month and the extra sacrifices for the feast days, man, you can get a day stat. Your whole herd's gone. In one day, you're mal- I'm trying to think here. Ah, skip it. One of, one of the sacrifices by the end of, by the time it was all done was over 300 animals. By the time it was over done, all done. Oh, it was a week long. It was the week long one. Because you sacrificed every day. You ended up sacrificing in a week over 300 animals. That's God showing that it takes the innocent to make you righteous. It was the blood of that animal. And hey, you didn't just drop the animal off at the door of the tabernacle or the, or the temple and let the priest do it. You took that knife in your hand and that priest put his hand on your hand and you both, he made you sacrifice those animals. You understood firsthand all the blood that was shed. Very symbolically, isn't it? I mean, that's a ridiculous amount of blood. All the blood that is shed pointing to the fact that our Savior's blood was shed and it was enough to cover all the sin of all the world. Which then opens up grace to us. Grace. Getting what you don't deserve. There's not one of us that deserves this. There's not one person here that deserves to have their sin forgiven. There's not one person here that has done anything enough to be forgiven, to get into heaven, to spend all of eternity with Jesus Christ. There's not one of us that's done enough. You can't do enough. There's one thing you have to do. Take what he's given you. He's given you his grace. Take it. Listen, if you love Jesus, you've asked him to forgive you. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Works are going to start happening. You're going to start doing things. You have a desire to, to be in the church. Not to be seen by other people, because if that's your motive, you're a wrong motive. That's not a godly motive. That's not driven by the Spirit. That's driven by selfishness, and that's driven by you. But if you're here to do something because you want to serve Jesus, you don't care who sees you. You know your Father sees you. You're not worried about a reward. Now you're not worried about a pat on the back. Now you're not worried about being brought up in front of everybody and looking. And, and I'm not against recognizing people for what they do. I think we should. Paul says we should. But not in such a way. And actually, you know what? The person who recognizes you doesn't steal your reward in heaven. The reality of it is, is if you're doing it to get to that point so somebody recognizes you, you've given up your reward in heaven. You've received your reward here. You know what? 
Not only that, just because you get recognized here, if you've done it on the right heart, just because you get recognized, just because you get found out, doesn't mean you lose your reward either. Doesn't mean that at all. It means God's taking that moment to stand you up in front of people as an example to the church of what it means to be a selfless person and serve. And everybody who acts on what you've done and is motivated to serve God in the same way you have, that just adds to your reward. That adds to your reward. You know Abraham wasn't Jewish, right? That's why Paul picked Abraham out. Jews didn't start until the 12th. Until Jacob's name was changed to Israel. That's when it started. Abraham wasn't a Jew. Isaac wasn't a Jew. God chose those two men to paint some amazing pictures of how much he loved us. But taking those Gentile men and preaching the gospel to them is what Paul just said here. And they believed. Not just in God. They believed in the Messiah that was to come. His seed. We'll look at that next week. It was not a promise to Abraham's seeds. It was a promise of and to Abraham's seed. Singular. The Messiah. 